like the uh, online teaching program program for the postgraduates across the country, the DN and the DNB postgraduates in cardiology. So this will be an online program, mostly case discussion, where you you will have the most experienced teachers in cardiology across India. So today we have three faculties, Dr. Deya Sagar Rao with 57 uh, years of experience in cardiology, who is one of the most revered uh, teachers in the country. And along with, uh, we have Dr. N. Sutey Kumar, who is the retired professor of cardiology from Medical College, Kotel, my teacher, and uh, who is so passionate about teaching. I think his only passion is teaching. I have learned cardiology from him. And also Koshisar, uh, George Koshisar, uh, retired as professor of cardiology, and he was of the study of cardiology at Trivandrum Medical College. He is also so passionate about teaching. So we have three great teachers, and it's a golden opportunity for all of us to learn, learn from these great teachers. Today, the case will be presented next time onwards. Uh, if after this class, somebody can volunteer for the next presentation uh, next month, that is next month. This time, my postgraduate will be presenting the case. He is Harip. Uh, he will be he's, uh, our second year postgraduate. He will be presenting the case. And Naveen, you want to tell something? And first, we'll show five questions. Each question, it will be 30 seconds. And you can answer it. Naveen will tell you how to answer it. And the person who scores the maximum mark will be given a prize and a certificate. It will take only five minutes. Sir. Thank you, doctor. As, as, sure. as the program evolves, uh, we may introduce uh, some theory topics also, which is of uh, practical importance, like uh, hemodynamics, uh, approach to a congenital heart disease, and all. It's all exam oriented and how to face the examiner. Navi, over. Yes, doctor. Thank you so much for the introduction, doctor. It's a good, it's a good opportunity for East West Pharma or the platform for the benefit of our postgraduates to face the exam, as you rightly said, doctor. And uh, doctors are requested, uh, once the question has shown, kindly reply in the chat box. So the first correct answer will be declared as the winner for the five questions. So, so each question we will uh, we will finalize one one winner. And Please. after the after answering, and I'm requesting the doctors to mention their name because someone has entered in their mobile name mobile name. So your name, institution with your mobile number, which institution you are pursuing your course and your mobile number, so that it is easy for us to hand over the uh, certificate as well as the gifts items to you. So once the chat, once the question opens, kindly reply in the chat box. After replying, relaxedly, you can uh, you can mention your name, institution, and mobile number. That's all, sir. Each, each question will have 45 seconds. So, Naveen, you should keep the time. After 45 sure. seconds, you should tell me to change the question. There will be altogether five sure. questions. So I'm uh, sharing my screen. Sure, sure. Sir. Now the time starts. All right. So this is a uh, so uh, not uh, right now because uh, I don't know whether they'll be able to see everything clearly. Yes, a 60, 60 years old male, diabetic, Parkinson's disease, admitted with fatigue. He gives a history of paroxysmal AF also. What is the diagnosis? Now the time starts. I am up, sir. Okay, we'll go to the next question. Yes. So this is uh, a 70-year-old hypertensive patient presented with history of chest pain. And when he presented in the emergency room, he was in cardiogenic shock. What's the diagnosis?
Time up, sir. So kindly unmute yourself and speak, sir. Sir. So what's the diagnosis? Repeat in full. I'm up, sir. The catheter position itself can tell you the diagnosis. This was one very uh, a, a favorite question of many of my examiners. Uh, oh, time up or? Yes, doctor. Time up, doctor. All right, okay. A 42 year old female with history of palpitation. And two episodes of syncope. Family history negative. Blood investigation revealed a high ESR. Coronary angiogram is normal. And what is the probable, most probable diagnosis? The etiological diagnosis. Naveen, answers are coming up? Yes, sir. Answers are coming up, sir. And now, time up. Sir. Okay. So, the last question. What is the diagnosis? Sir, I'm up, sir. Okay. So, Demar, sir, can I take the liberty of uh, uh, inviting you to discuss this? Two minutes for each slide. Sir, you are muted. One. Ah, yeah. So this, I'll discuss this thing because basically the patient has eight fibrillation. Then it's a very funny thing. Because the rate has suddenly increased, but if you look at V4, V5, it gives us some clue to me that there are organized QRS complexes with something which are coming extra. So uh, that could be one clue because otherwise it looks like um, apparently it looks like uh, a fibrillation pre-excitation, but there was no pre-excitation in the regular complexes. Dose it very unlikely because this. I don't know whether it is a simultaneous or not. It may not be simultaneous. Is it simultaneous spacing? Then it is easy. Here you can find there is a normal QRS, but the QRS is abnormal here. And so many additional deflections coming here, which is not seen here. Here also you find there is a narrow QRS with additional things. So I think basically this is an artifact. Absolutely, sir. Uh, uh, when you see such broad QRS complex tachycardia, as sir suggested, uh, you have to differentiate between a ventricular tachycardia, a toll set, or a supraventricular tachycardia with uh, reasons for a broad QRS complex. But uh, this is something called a tremor artifact. The clue is it's a Parkinson's disease patient. And you can see the real QRS complex in between. This is known as artifact. Always keep in mind when you see an ICG, which you cannot explain what it is. Think in terms of electrolyte imbalance, think about WPW syndrome, Think about hyperkalemia, think about artifacts. Sir, am I right? Yeah. Whenever you find a funny electrocardiogram, suspect an artifact if it doesn't fit in with the classical thing. Because uh, I don't know whether I can use the, whether my pointer is 
it is very clearly seen in lead 3 first yeah. four complexes are normal then if you look at uh, v3 v3 you find narrow qrs complex v4 v5 and you can see additional things appearing and as i said parkinson's disease artifact tremor artifact uh, is the likely possibility and the lead 3 it is atrial fibrillation it is an atrial yeah, it's atrial fibrillation it's because we have already said that this patient has atrial fibrillation and there is a varying rr interval in lead 3 it is very clear now only a small point is yeah uh, you take that lead 3 you don't find any artifact i agree basically yeah. it is parkinsonism atrial fibrillation and tremor artifact but very peculiar in yeah. lead 3 you find uh, no artifact in can all of the leads can you go you back have... yes sir can you go back that looks oh. very peculiar that now, is all there is a can you go back to the ec uh, yes, one in v, actually again, in v4 also yeah. you can find the qrs in between yeah. arrow qrs in between yeah. but only thing the lead three looks okay without any artifact that's the only very peculiar thing and the lead one again you know the initial part there is no tremor okay tremor can be episodic maybe patient got excited at that point of time then the tremor became more shall, I give an, shall I give an explanation for that, which may or may not be acceptable? It depends on the axis of the artifact. Because the axis of the artifact will determine the morphology. If you look at lead 3, I will say that the artifact, the axis of the artifact is uh, perpendicular to that. And the maximum is seen in AVR. The maximum. <laughs> could be, could be. Right. No, that's the only explanation I have. Because earlier I have gone through that. Because when you find atrial flutter like this, in certain leads, it may not be very impressive. Anyway. That's a debatable thing. Okay, go ahead. This law, this sir, a 70 year old hypertensive with history yeah. of pain, cardiogenic shock. Oh, who wants to discuss this? Mm. Me or? Uh... What is that? No, definite things. So there is left ventricular hypertrophy. There's no doubt about that. There is pericardial effusion. There's no doubt about that. And if you look at the pericardial cavity, you find uh, there is. Uh, uh, probably a clot and all very clearly seen. Then inside the ascending aorta, there is something oh, yeah. moving like that. Yes, and I'm not too sure whether the aorta it is, is dilated. Uh, ascending aorta is dilated. dilated. The aortic valve looks uh, the a closer point, and it's not that there's no suggestion of a bicuspid aortic valve. There is probably an intima moving, um, uh, intimal tear in between. I'm not too sure about that. So, definite thing is uh, there is some diastolic, there is some collapse of the uh, right ventricular outflow that is also seen. So, definite thing is a uh, pericardial effusion, probably a hemopericardium with some evidence of cardiac tamponade, severe degree of left ventricular hypertrophy, aortic root dilatation, and uh, some suggestion of an aortic dissection. So, it could be an aortic dissection, a rupture into the pericardium, hemopericardium, cardiac tamponade. That's yes, what sir, I think. Absolutely. It shows uh, uh, hypertension, dilated yeah, that's right. dissection, yeah. rupture into the pericardium, hemopericardium. We lost this patient. I also thought the same thing because LVH, hypertension, large iota, and uh, the, the reset dissection, and that root is grossly dilated, especially the anterior part. And this, I think, is very simple. OK. Yes. Sir, could I you think even yeah. without all those, the final catheter goes itself, you should be able to tell the yeah. diagnosis. But initially, the confusion can come with that all wires. All exactly, exactly. <laughs> initially, exactly. I was confused why this wire is being given. But finally, this is the thing. I don't know whether the people have seen, the students have seen this. When we are students, there is no problem that straight away it is a catheter position of a patent ductus arteriosis. It goes like that. But uh, initially, I also got confused. Why this wire, all those things? <laughs> what was the difficulty in getting to the RV, all those things? The students, they may not be familiar because unless they have been trained or shown this, people are not doing this nowadays. The classical going up to the RV of protract and then coming back in the counter close, close direction. So the, the thing which we have been taught is you look at the catheter entry from where and where it is landing. <clears throat> the catheter has gone from the venous side and has landed in the descending aorta and that landing, that turn occurred at the base of the heart and is on the left side. So these are some of the clues to say that 
this has occurred at the arterial level if it has been uh, ascending aorta it should have gone like that this is a typical thing which is an examination for us during our training period okay so uh, this i discuss this is a 42 years old female with history of palpitation and two i think uh, can i make one comment here for the last case yeah yeah come uh, sir, uh, sir yeah. Yeah. Uh, can we see that uh, image again the last image Uh, I, you, you want me to uh, go Previous back? Image. Previous one. Yeah, yeah, just one. Image. Yeah, exactly. That's the one uh, with that uh, wire, so-called wire, and then entering it. I can see, sir. The wire is hitting the ventricle, and there is VPC is coming up in the lower border uh, in electrocardiogram. Yeah. I think it is important to to realize. Uh, For the students, that the so-called wire is gone below the developed diaphragm. Otherwise, sometimes you might go into the left pulmonary artery and then reach the periphery, and one might think that it is a ductus. Mistakes have been done like that. So it is general rule that when you find that it is there, the wire or the thing to go below the level of diaphragm to be sure that uh, you are not in the <clears throat> distal portion of the left pulmonary artery. Okay, sir. So, uh, uh, history of palpitation is likely to be arrhythmic palpitation because you can see the electrocardiogram. There are abnormalities in the electrocardiogram. This electrocardiogram shows that the broad QRS complex, intraventricular conduction defect, maybe some uh, uh, to, towards the left bundle branch block pattern. The PR interval is long, so of course there is a conduction abnormality. And this one, there is a broad QRS, regular tachycardia with AV dissociation. That is a ventricular tachycardia. And when you see a ventricular tachycardia with AV block, you should think of an infiltrative uh, myocardial problem due to an infiltrative disease. And in the echocardiogram, one typical thing you can see a scooped out appearance of the basal part of the interventricular septum, basal uh, ante anterior septum. There is a scooped out appearance. The, The myocardium seems to be abnormal, little thickened, little little sparkling. Uh, so all these things uh, point towards one disease that is sarcoidosis. So cardiac sarcoidosis is a disease where where you can have tachyarrhythmias, bradyarrhythmias, conduction defects, and uh, some regional ball motion abnormalities and thinning fibrosis. In the investigation which this patient requires is you can look for a serum X and then a cardiac MR. Sir, this one, I think. Rao, sir, sir, could you discuss yeah. for the student? Uh, this is a simultaneous recording of the ventricle and the arterial tracing. I'm assuming that it is in the because the pressure data is not obvious. I'm assuming that this is, this is 200. So LV yeah. femoral artery. This is uh, written down there. LV and, and femoral artery, and uh, um, what you find in the the ectopic beat, following the ectopic beat, uh, there is uh, some increase in the gradient. Uh, there is some gradient even before that, but uh, the diastolic pressure following the ectopic beat is low. So this is uh, probably one might say. How much increase in the gradient? I'm not able to calculate it here. Maybe thirty uh, millimeters. Where is it written? No, sir. Zero millimeters lower and twenty millimeters up means everything will be around twenty millimeters. Twenty. <laughs> it is zero yeah. is lower down and two hundred. So each column will be twenty millimeters. Sir. Twenty millimeters. Each yeah. is twenty. Twenty. So it is about thirty millimeters. Thirty millimeters. Thirty thirty-five. You know. So yeah, but, uh, what was Maybe twenty thirty. Yeah. Resting gradient was how much? So that's around thirty, sir. But what? Mm -hmm. There also is around twenty to thirty. That's 20 a marginal increase only, sir. Yeah, yeah. marginal yeah. increase only. But then we are trying to calculate the gradients between LV and uh, femoral artery to show an obstruction. It is going to underestimate the degree of uh, obstruction. Because femoral artery pressures are going to be amplified, and you are going to underestimate the degree of uh, obstruction. 
be that as it may, uh, that post ectopic beat, there is an increase in the gradient. So this kind of a thing. But then what happens to the yeah. pulse pressure? Yeah. Here? That's right, sir. After the, the systolic pressure beat, is high, the pulse pressure is very high. Yeah. And in the post ectopic beat, the pulse, pulse pressure, pressure is widening. Is the post that ectopic is a, pressure. But, yeah. Post ectopic uh, beat. Pulse uh, pressure pulse is widening. Pressure, is widening. Is widening and uh, Diastolic pressure is almost the same. Sir, following the, same. the ectopic beat, so, the diastolic pressure is low. Otherwise, uh, the diastolic pressures are the same. There is an increase in the pulse pressure. Basic pulse pressure is also wide. There is a sharp upstroke, sharp downstroke. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. this is a uh, thing where we have missed out the. Yeah. Okay. So there is some gradient, but. Um, uh, the post ectopic beat, uh, there is uh, increase in the gradient, but basically the pulse pressure and uh, the pulse width, both of them have increased. The, this is not the case, what you expect in a patient with hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. This is something like... Uh, uh, Sir, can it be AR? Because the upstroke of the arterial pulse is very fast. The peak is not only upstroke, but even the pulse pressure is white. Ah, pulse pressure is white. The if you look yeah. at the arterial pulse, sharp upstroke, ill sustained peak, yeah. rapidly coming down, uh -huh. and a pulse pressure. And then there is no diode in uh, 70 millimeters of mercury. And uh, the gradient, when there is something aortic runoff, the gradient may not be that significant. I also was not it's sure only... because the diastolic pressure is not that low. It is 20, 40, 60. Uh, around 70 millimeters. So the blood yes. pressure comes to around 140 by 70. So there is a 70 millimeters pulse pressure, rapid upstroke, rapid downstroke, and in the post ectopic everything is widening. So and there I is no diagnosis. Be, yeah, I thought it could be aortic runoff. I also aortic think runoff? so. Aortic I also runoff? think so. Basically, the white pulse aortic pressure runoff, uh, with some amount of stenosis. Could be because the pulse pressure is wide, it is around 70 or 75. Yeah, we'll hear from Jabber. Yes, sir. Uh, In, I, uh, if the, I, I wanted to keep it to uh, make a little confusion regarding whether it is because whenever they see a pressure tracing with a ventricular premature contraction. <laughs> Students always have the tendency to put it as brown wall broken bro phenomena. <laughs> this is the opposite of brown wall. It is an exaggeration. This anyway is not HCM. It is not HCM. No yes. doubt about that. Uh, There's no pulse, uh, uh, The pulse pressure should come down. Here the pulse pressure rather than uh, valvular uh, aortic valvular problem, aortic stenosis plus aortic regurgitation is what uh, I expect. No, no. I, I have some differences because the pressure tracing morphology doesn't favor obstruction. Mm -hmm. Because it is exactly. a sharp upstroke, ill sustained peak for both the ventricular and aortic pressure. And as Koshi suggested, I also thought like that. Basic gradient is only 30 millimeters, which in a hyperdynamic circulation has limitation. And the post ectopic bit, if you look at the uh, that gradient, there is no significant difference. Both the arterial pulse and the ventricular pressure price has gone up. So I feel it is a simple uh, aortic runoff. Anyway, I think the aortic. important uh, point is whenever uh, uh, tracing like this is shown with the ventricular ectopic. Immediately, people will tell you this hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with obstruction. That yeah. mistake should not be made. That, <laughs> it might have come. Some students might have answered it as HCM. That I am sure. I also agree with you that some students might have answered it as HOCM. Because many times, uh, valvular aortic stenosis no, will be bought. And yeah. it may be mistaken. The people may think the moment you see the ectopic, you think it is. <laughs> hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with obstruction. Students so I think it is good. I think uh, we can accept <laughs> the diagnosis of aortic regression plus minus aortic stenosis. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I think students, that can be accepted. Can Both has to be considered. Meet, uh, the post ectopic meet aortic pressure tracing in HOCM, there should be a fall in the pulse pressure. Here, there is a fall in the pulse pressure. That that is the most important the pulse pressure. Yeah. That's that it. The students should be clear because uh, those tracings are very, very likely Actually, shown during exam. The original description is failure of the pulse pressure to rise or it falls. Normally, 
without um, uh, hyper uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy the pulse pressure should increase in the post ectopic beat original description was failure of the pulse pressure to rise or a fall in the pulse pressure that is broken bro brown wall moro phenomenon i think uh, rao sir may be able to contribute yeah actually uh, at the bedside following the ectopic beat if the pulse volume becomes less then yeah, we need to consider at a serious consideration about hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy normally after ectopic beat the pulse volume is bigger normally in the absence of any obstruction um, but in patients with uh, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy the the pulse volume post ectopic beat is rather uh, smaller than normal and that is the that is the crux of the problem in making a diagnosis second thing is that it is uh, probably you know uh, worth mentioning uh, that even under normal circumstances so the peak although the pulse volume increases the rarely goes beyond the normal value so if it is a peak systolic pressure was uh, before the ectopic beat after the ectopic beat normally the peak pressure does not go beyond 120 the same thing as the pre ectopic beats uh, this is due, surprisingly is in patients with lv dysfunction the post ectopic solid pressure goes up various explanations have been given but it is worth remembering that now there is no increase in the peak systolic pressure but in a bad lv the peak systolic pressure goes up ियलीफिक Whereas uh, right side, the post-ectopic beat right ventricular pressure rises normally. If there is an outflow obstruction, the post-ectopic pressure rises. If there is a large VSD, the LV RV behaves like phasing the aorta. The basic difference is in the vascular resistance, which is happening in beat beat. I think the postgraduate should go through that because we no, have so many other things to discuss. But uh, it is important to remember. At the peak systolic LV pressure rises in all functionally uh, low LV ventricles. That is, uh, has been discovered so that amplification of the LV peak systolic after an ectopic beat should not be taken as normal or uh, more than normal, but it is a, a manifestation of the LV dysfunction rather than good LV function. Shall yeah. we go to the case presentation? Okay. Yeah. Hari, yeah, I, sure. I, I I thought it could be one hour for the case for a case presentation and discussion. And the examiner decide on which way it should go. I think I am Hari is our student. I think Rao sir and Dr. Koshi can and the details. And I will just uh, the listener or. Uh, But both of you can um, lead the discussion because uh, he is our student, and we have been grilling him. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go ahead. Uh, the case of a thirty-nine-year-old gentleman from Kottayam. His work. He presented with a history of recent worsening of dyspnea for the past six months. You have the PowerPoint, then why you don't need? You don't. You have I the PowerPoint or have the PowerPoint? Share the screen and show the PowerPoint the history, so that it is easy for the examiners to discuss. We should see his video also. We should uh, see him. Show so the candidate. Yeah. 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 The PowerPoint was for uh, uh, Echo ECG, sir. Oh, uh, you don't. Uh, 
Okay. Okay, go ahead, Hari then. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. Thirty-nine year old gentleman from Kotayam is working as a tax. See Some problem with your audio. Primita, is there a problem with this? Uh, activity there. Dr. In case uh, you have connectivity problem means you can uh, uh, off your video and you can speak. Please because... turn off the video. If I turn off the video, probably you can have a better, Ari, I think then put off the limited bandwidth. Am I right? Unmute. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Can you hear Yeah, go ahead. He presented with a Disney on exertion class three. Uh, for six months duration of me uh, for four months duration. Um, he has a history of rheumatic heart disease at the age of 12 years and uh, insulin injections for three to four years. And let me interrupt. Is it rheumatic heart disease or rheumatic, uh, rheumatic fever? Sir. Okay. Rheumatic fever at the age of 12 years. Years in monthly pencil injections for three to four years, and later on he lost follow up. He developed symptoms in the in the form of dyspnea and exertion and severe fatigue for the last 10 years and uh, intermittent palpitations for the last eight years. The Disney and exertion. Uh, initially, he used to uh, walk for some kilometers, and later on, his uh, speed came down, and he he used to develop by 800 meters, many around 800 meters, and uh, uh, was persistent for the last uh, last 10 years. Disney and exertion progressed three Disney for the last six years. Was not associated with orthopnea, PND. Okay, again, you, when you presented initially, you told Disney on exertion for six months and you told for four months. Yeah. Uh, uh, sir, actually, uh, for post valve replacement, so history started earlier. In between, he became asymptomatic and then he symptoms reappeared. When did he have his uh, first symptoms? Natural history. Natural history? Before or after? Yes, sir. 10 years back. Oh, sorry. 10 years. What is the time? 29 years. 29 years, he had symptoms? Yes, sir. And then when did he undergo the surgery? Surgery was eight months back. That is how many years of gap between the onset of symptoms and the surgery? Nine years. Sir. Was it only one? Nine years. Nine years. Mm -hmm. So when was the surgery? And what kind of symptoms? Surgery, surgery was eight months ago. My, uh, Yes. Sir. Then why don't you present it as a continuum? Yes, sir. See, we are clear that he had rheumatic fever at the age of 12 years. That part we are very clear. Yeah. And he is symptomatic from the age of 29 years. Yes, sir. Okay, then why don't you chronological order about the sequence of events? Okay. Uh, okay. Back he was okay, okay. Then as an internal examiner, try to help you. Because this is a teaching session. Let me put it like this. This uh, 13 year old gentleman with history suggestion of 12 years, developing symptom of external breath lessons for the last 10 years, from class 2 to class 3 over so much time, underwent valve surgery, it has now presented with history of rapidly progressive symptoms for the last six months. 
with our opinion for the last four months. If you present, is it okay? Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, that is the way you can present this history. Present then... the history because everything is clear. Why do you want to hide and break it? So, gentleman, with this stuff, you can say that they discontinued all those things in the history. History of years, symptomatic for the last 10 years, progressing from class 2 to 3. Parallel disease, androgen barrel surgery about nine months back. Now presenting with progress for the last six months from class three to, cl to class four with orthopnea. The diagnosis straight away. Am I right, sir? Because I contribute to the other postgraduates how to present this also. Okay. <laughs> Okay, the no. uh, modification from our side also will be useful. Okay, go ahead. Number then, so that uh, the sequence of events will give you the nature of this disease. Suppose the patient has had uh, from 12 years to 20, he was he did not have much of symptoms. Now afterwards, uh, in the next uh, symptoms. He had severe symptoms as to warrant surgery after nine years. So what kind of walnut heart disease will that be, which where the symptoms last one decade? You could have avoided the problem by presenting as it's a status post valve replacement and much symptoms. So <laughs> then the examiner knows that a new problem so there is a history that is remaining there. Then he can, otherwise people will think that you are telling. Now you are telling that there is a ten year. Exactly. I think you should present it as a continuum. And there won't be any confusion. <laughs> was he asymptomatic after the surgery? Yes, sir. He was asymptomatic for after surgery. And that's also important, you know. Yeah, it was symptomatic, and then how the symptoms started. Then we will get a very clear kind of a complication he developed following. He had rheumatic fever, he became symptomatic after 15 years. Yes, okay, sir. rheumatic fever at the age of 12 years, symptomatic from the 20. age of 29 years, necessitating a surgical intervention after around nine years. So you had to tell about the nature of the heart disease, the type of valvular heart disease which he had, what could have been the surgery which was performed. He remained asymptomatic for a while and then became symptomatic. And what could have been the complication which he developed? You should be able to throw some light in these areas. Okay, take uh, one by one. There is one yes. traumatic view is clear. So we are talking about traumatic valvular heart disease. So he developed a hemodynamic problem after uh, 15 years. What does this hemodynamic problem indicate? Is it a low cardiac output? Is it a pulmonary venous congestion? Is it pulmonary arterial hypertension? Is it systemic venous congestion? And what is the rhythm status? These are things which you have to derive from the history. That is what Rao's are wanted. So what is the hemodynamics? Yes. What is the cardiac output? What is the systemic and pulmonary venous pressure? What is the PA pressure? What is the systemic venous pressure? That is right heart and the rhythm problem. These are things which you have to contribute. Because no, three symptoms you Sorry. told. You told about dyspnea, you told about palpitations, you told about fatigue. fatigue. Yes, sir. And orthopnea. So, first, pre operative. Oh, that is later. Or? later. No, sir. Ten years back, uh, it was okay. only dyspnea okay. and fatigue for ten uh, ten years, uh, and uh, palpitations intermittent to regular fast palpitations for eight years of duration. Okay. After developing palpitations, he was reevaluated and advised valve replacement surgery eight years back, but uh, he didn't undergo surgery and was on medical follow up. Uh, one year back, he developed. Uh, uh, Progressing worsening of dyspnea. No, no, we understand all those three. things. So, do, do you think it is a mitral valvular heart disease or aortic valve disease, regurgitant, stenotic, pulmonary hypertension? 
right heart failure. What do you think about the sequence? You tell the sequence till he underwent surgery. What do you think about the nature of disease? The hemodynamics and the nature of disease. So, and and Is it a right heart symptom or a left, heart, left symptom heart symptom? Had? Symptoms. Okay. And uh, could be stenotic because of uh, severe fatigue as a low cardiac output. Isn't the and point? Dyspnea. It's a gradually progressive dyspnea on exertion spanning over a period of almost nine years. That's the most important point. It's a gradual a progressive disease and the patient remains symptomatic for long. Isn't it? So long he remains symptomatic. It is a situation where what does the paroxysmal palpitation mean? Suggest of atrial fibrillations. Is it exertional or non-exertional? Non-exertional. So you think it could be paroxysmal atrial fibrillation? Atrial fibrillation. Okay. So, what do you think uh, could be the nature of the disease which the patient had? If Romantic. there is an atrial fibrillation, if there is atrial fibrillation, which valve you think is most likely to be mitral stenosis? Mitral valve. Mitral valve. So, mitral valve. So, you have got a clue that, got a clue that there is a mitral valve disease. You have also got a clue. The patient had a long history of asymptomatic period or few symptomatic uh, less symptoms until it reached a stage wherein it was complicated by arrhythmia and then had to symptoms became worse and then he had to undergo surgery. So, what is your most likely diagnosis? Keeping all these things in view. Yes, it's. So you just guess what? dominant mitral stenotic or regular determination? Stenotic. Stenotic. Because you think gradually what is the stenotic? Yes. How long did it take from class 2 to progress to class 3? Uh, it took nearly 9 years. Any PND? No PND. No PND. Okay. I have a... Any history? Any history of right heart failure? No, sir. No history of right heart failure. So, not two points. So, a patient with mitral stenosis, patient with suspected mitral stenosis, no history suggestive of uh, right heart failure, and no history of nocturnal dyspnea. Now, he's coming up with uh, progressive worsening of dyspnea. So, what do you think can happen with mitral stenosis to lead to this stage? Can you connect fatigue with yeah. mitral valve disease? That's MS right. and MR? I think uh, my, approach will, uh, my approach will be like this because uh, because they're teaching such also. There's three main things. One is progressive breathlessness after a long asymptomatic period. Second is your palpitation, which I would like to clarify. Take this day. Third is the fatigue. As I've told you, all the three things need inflammation. So, what does fatigue indicate? The cardiac no, output is inadequate. Which are the parallel reasons no. where fatigue can occur? Fatigue can occur. One is obstruction, otherwise, pH. So, these two, th this you have to correlate. The only thing about your paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, uh, when was this detected? Because in microval disease, it is very unlikely that they will have a long history of paroxysmal AF. That is less likely in mitralysis because AF is related mainly to the size or pressure of the atrium. So once they have developed atrial fibrillation, you may have initially a few episodes over a short time. What is the duration of that uh, paroxysmal palpitation? Yeah, immediately after developing palpitations, he was advised surgery. Okay, it uh, was in the late. Yes, so it was. He has symptom onset of breathlessness at the age of 29, 29 years. years. Progress as other teachers have discussed. Class two to class three. What was the duration? Uh, that was how three. much? And that was for the next two to from three two years. Two to three years he has progressed. That means the Progress. venous pressure has gone up fairly fast. Then only after nine years you underwent surgery. Yes. When did palpitation occur? Palpitations uh, 
after uh, at the age of 32, 32 like, years after that 2 years 29 years he had a dyspnea exertion class 2 then class 3 by what age this is what class 3 uh, yes, class 3 in dyspnea and palpitations at the same time 30, 32 years of age 2 years class 3 and paroxysmal palpitation and he remained in paroxysmal palpitation for the next 9 years yes sir. For, for the next six that years. Is, that is very unusual. That is very unusual. Because unusual. one microbial disease developed class 3 symptoms, then their LA pressure is fairly high, the LA is likely to be dilated, and if they develop AF, maybe for a short period it will be paroxysmal, but unlikely to have paroxysmal AF for six years. That is How very unlikely. Years? They're going for a permanent AF by... Seldom we get that history of proximal palpitation, viral disease, very unusual. But even if they get proximal palpitation, they rapidly generate permanent or chronic or whatever it will be. So you have to clarify that history whether it was irregular or not. Because it is extremely difficult because if it is not paroxysmal palpitation, why don't we consider aortic valve disease also? Because para atrial ablation, as Rausar has said, is strongly in favor of mitral disease. There's pretty long history. So, whereas paroxysmal arrhythmias can occur in other diseases also. So, when you get breathlessness, class 3, pulmonary venous hypertension. When there is extreme fatigue on exertion, either aortic stenosis or pulmonary hypertension due to a mitral disease. But if a mitral disease has developed pH, then atrial ablation will, will occur, permanent AF will occur. So we have to clarify the history to make sure whether it is mitral valve disease or aortic valve disease or a combination. Okay, but the important thing is, he, rather than exactly telling the diagnosis, what are the abnormalities in this case? Pulmonary venous congestion, inadequate cardiac output, and an arrhythmic uh, symptom, which I would like to uh, evaluate in detail. History for palpitation is quite vague and it is extremely difficult to analyze the history to say whether it's paroxysmal, is it irregular or not? We also find it difficult. I've got about I agree. But analyzing yes, fatigue and palpitations are more difficult than analyzing the snare of excess. Especially fatigue, it is very difficult. Another small point, in chronic severe MR, you can have fatigue because uh, there is some, you know, at least in the textbook description, we don't find it very often, chronic severe MR, two symptoms. One is palpitation and one is fatigue. These are two important symptoms. So it is good I think to, it is important to realize. It is important to realize that atrial fibrillation in rheumatic wall disease is not only represents the severity of the disease, but also depends upon the age of the patient. Very rare in the younger population, but as we put on years, by the time there is the age of 40, the severe valvular heart disease, mitral valve, many of them tend to develop atrial fibrillation. And once they develop it, it stays like that. It is very rare, as Dr. Sudhar Kumar has said, going, going on paroxysmally for a number of years. My next question to you is, uh, what exactly you meant by class 3 symptoms? Um, Hari Prasad? Yes, sir. Uh, what exactly did you mean? What is that? Class 3. Class 3. Uh, he developed a How do you assess it? You can he tell the definition of class 3. That may be enough. You can tell the definition. Then we we'll say class 3. Yes, sir. He developed symptoms with minimal exertions. Uh, like what? Like walking for 100 to, 100 to 200 meters. Going to nearby shop. Previously, he used to go without uh, much difficulty. Uh, gradually, he developed uh, uh, developed symptoms even to reach that shop. So, when you when you translate that into amount of work, how much will that correspond? How many minutes of work it corresponds to? So, you may be able. You understood the question. You may be yes. able to answer. In which classification this medicine is used? In which uh, yes. that is the way they are asking. So, in which yes. 
set classification and this is the same two mets something else two mets two seven seven is not really that is a specific activity scheme specific activity goldman goldman specific goldman specific activity is 753 Three. Okay. 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 So, what are the usual usual activities which require more than three minutes of work? Yeah. General activities. Climbing stairs. Climbing stairs is much more than that. It is much <laughs> more than that, you know. So, that uh, when you are trying to evaluate symptoms, you need to go systematically. Hari, how much can you compare to self care activities? So one is self care activities. Then second comes your household activities. Then comes leisure activities. Then comes your sporting activities. So at what level is he is he able to do? Can he take care of his self care activities? Yes, sir. You know, you might not have gone into the details because you are facing this question for the first time. So you might have been very casual in taking that. So I think uh, before answering that question, you can say, "Sir, I have not gone into detail." So take anticipatory bail. Otherwise, you will end up in trouble. Are you asking what we have to do? No, no. Actually, actually, one of the common uh, what do you call self care activities he is taking a bath all by himself. Is three minutes. If somebody can take a bath on their own without getting breathlessness or chest discomfort. that is uh, that says that uh, his activity is yes, he can do activities more than 3 minutes of work okay so if he can do more than 3 minutes of activity certainly it won't fall into the category of functional class 3 that's the point i think it is because it is important to evaluate the functional limitation one of the important guidelines for when to intervene in a valvular heart disease is functional class One of the important, apart from LV function status, important determinant of timing of surgery is functional class. So you need to spend a lot of time to know what, you know, what is the functional class and what are the functional limitations. I think we'll go, yeah. you know, we'll forward. go to the physical. Before yeah, that, yeah. so uh, summarizing yeah. the data, history of rheumatic fever, asymptomatic for a long period. Then developing symptom of breathlessness, progressing from class two to three. And, and as Dr. Koshi said, there is some history of fatigue. So more likely, we have said it is myocardial disease because that is much more common. The question is: Is it likely to be dominant regurgitation or stenosis? Because of the long history and slow progression, more likely to be dominant MR rather than we don't say it is pure MR. Dominant. Commonly, it is mixed myocardial disease. It is a Isolated MR is less common. Isolated MS is also less common. Commonly, it is mixed myocardial disease. So personally, I feel it could be dominant MR, and the palpitation need not be atrial fibrillation. It may be uh, non-arrhythmic even. So that will be my approach. The next question is: He underwent surgery. He had. Um, you might not have gone into details. If he has been absolutely asymptomatic. Because three months is less likely to become normally active, so you uh, cannot say that the patient was asymptomatic. So you is there a gap? Because after that, it's only nine months. There is a rapid progression of the symptoms, and you should explain what could have been the possibilities for this decompensation uh, after surgery, which occurred fairly after a short time. That three months interval, you cannot say it is normal because. the patient will be in the hospital for about a week or two then the patient you know after the chest uh, surgery coming back to a um, near normal activity it will take 3 months it will take 3 months usually so you can't say that the patient was absolutely asymptomatic and then develop the class 3 symptoms if he goes in for class 3 you should have been class 2 before that so that point you have to be clear but more important is why why he developed the compensation post op That is an important issue in this case. Certainly, I, mean, like, I think that triggers that, some discussion. That triggers. So, what are the possibilities? After that, we will go to the physical. Yeah, that. Uh, before that, I think, I think uh, Hari, did you really uh, ask about the post-operative immediate post-operative cause? What 
of the surgery, a simple straightforward surgery where the patient was discharged in a week time after one week or one or two days, was he exclimated, was he shifted to the ward, then discharged by one week. Was it a normal post-operative course, uneventful post-operative course, or was it an eventful post-operative course? And what was the discharge medication at the time of, you know, the discharge? Was he on multiple medicines or he was on minimal medicines? Anticoagulation? He is on anticoagulation. Uh, sir, for a discussion purpose, I'll give you the real history. This person had a very stormy post -operative. I know that. that is, you have taken the same uh, thing. That usually happened. He was yes, Rao, sir. Uh, yeah, yeah. He, was, he was taken after two two days from the ward for a reopening. So he had a little post-operative course was not the usual uneventful post-operative course. He had a reopening. Then actually following the surgery, he was never asymptomatic. He had symptoms. He was in class two symptom. Then rapidly he progressed to a class three symptom recently and got admitted in the hospital where he underwent evaluation. I think it is important for the candidates to remember that in patients with severe MR and mild LV dysfunction, when you replace the wall, the LV function deteriorates because there is an increase in the afterload to these, in these patients. So these, uh, these points have to be understood that uh, MR with LV dysfunction, the, you are underestimating the degree of LV dysfunction. So we need to go a bit more details into the what, what status of the LV function or the patient had, and uh, what are the possible causes for worsening of the, what do you call, cardiovascular status in the perioperative period? So that's a that is a huge question by itself. We have to go into the intraoperative procedures and uh, what was the myocardial protection uh, given, and what was the wall that was put. So there are so many questions. But I think, be that as it may, I think this patient uh, had symptoms leading to surgery. Unfortunately, post-operatively, uh, you did not do that well. Let it put that way. You'll go to the physical examination in the interest of the time. It's already Hani, was there any fever? Yes. No, sir. No no history of prolonged fever. Uh, it, it was actually dual well replacement. Okay. okay. Was it an acute onset of the symptom or a continuation of uh, the symptoms? Gradually after. progressive symptoms oh. over the last six months. I think your approach should be like this. Is it a problem related to the basic disease where assessment and planning was not perfect? As Rao uh -huh. said, because this patient has mitral valve disease, regurgitation or whatever it is, if it is regurgitation lesion, he has developed LB dysfunction because he has developed severe symptoms. So whether the preoperative evaluation risk stratification was right or wrong. Second thing, operative problems. Then problems occurring after surgery related to that early. Is it technical? That is related to a surgical thing because the patient had to be opened up again. So what are the reasons for reopening? That you should know. Then third is why he developed because of a new event. Yeah. That is a factor which precipitates a new problem. But from Dr. Jabba's view, there was a continuum. That is he did not improve. So there were problems. One is evaluation, risk stratification was not right. Or intraoperative, there were problems related to the procedure. Okay. And the third he is... He was symptomatic, but not that okay. symptomatic and the rapid worsening recently. Whether it is related to that postoperative, intraoperative problem, which is rapidly worsening, or as Dr. Koshi said, are there something which is happening new, just like arrhythmias, endocarditis? I think one, so that one, is the way you have to... One point is, if it is related to the pre-existing assessment, you know, like left ventricular function issue or something like that, then, you know, the, the deterioration would have been immediately following the surgery. Here, I think you get a feeling that there was some improvement after surgery at the time of discharge, and then there was a progressive deterioration signifying that there was some new event developed related to the prosthetic valve, uh, something related to that. Or, uh, so if so, what are the possibilities which come to your mind related to the uh, prosthetic valve? 
well surgery prosthetic valve malfunction that is what he is asking okay i think you should go into the details because rao sir was telling that we have to running short of okay i think we will go to the physical i think post graduates in general who are attending don't think that uh, harry is uh, performing in a uh, not up to the mark it is extremely difficult for a candidate to present in presence of a large number of colleagues and unfamiliar examiners so these are the points which you have to be kept in mind and all the post graduate should go into this that is pre op in drop and later what are the problems they can develop i think you have to go through that and discuss with your concern uh, teachers uh, 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 we can add one more thing is when you look at the post operative patients they have to think in terms of is it a myocardial problem is it a valve related problem is it an uh, uh, is it a arrhythmia related problem is it a pulmonary artery hypertension related problem so these four things you have to which was not which was missed the operative uh, myocardial okay. an arrhythmia an infection so all these things you have to uh, the the uh, uh, take into consideration go ahead can we go to the physical findings uh, please go ahead with the physical findings please tell the please tell us the relevant yeah, that physical findings positive physical findings hari hari you are not audible you are not audible unmute you are muted uh -huh. okay. yes sir yeah. uh, and okay. no pallor cyanosis clubbing or okay, uh, lymphadenopathy Uh, pulse is seventy six per minute, regular, normal volume, no vessel wall thickening, no radio pulse radar. Radio regular, 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 regular. Okay. So the okay. patient was not was not having palpitation at this time. Uh, no sir. Okay. Blood blood pressure is one twenty no, 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 no. by seventy. Pulse seventy six per minute, regular, normal volume. Normal volume. Okay. Okay. No vessel wall thickening. No radio radar. I think no vessel wall thickening is probably the least important. You tell about the other thing. <laughs> peripheral pulses are okay. okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Peripheral pulses. What was the blood pressure? What was the blood pressure? Blood pressure is one twenty by seventy in right arm supine position. Okay. okay. And what is the pulse pressure? Fifty. Is that normal or uh, at the post-op patients? Who is symptomatic? Who is symptomatic? Is it normal on the higher Absolutely. side or the lower side? That's no. raise an alarm. It's on the higher side. Pulse pressure is on fifty. Pulse pressure, na? Yes. Yeah. So in the patient who has undergone wall replacement, the pulse pressure and then patient is symptomatic, worsening dyspnea, and the pulse pressure is high. So, what should be your thought process related to the valve? Do you think there is? You said there is no pallor. No pallor. There is nothing else. Okay. So, is it related to the valve? Valvular leak. Is it related to the valve? Iotic valvular leak. Iotic valvular. Iotic leak. You may be thinking. Okay. Are there iotic valve replacement because it's a two valve replacement? Yes, sir. Iotic and mitral. Double valve replacement. Key sir, isn't it? You said double valve. Yes. Okay. So uh, after aortic wall replacement, you are expecting a wide pulse pressure. Okay, go ahead. Acute question: In the general examination, which are the most important things you should look for? Three, three or four things: a patient post-operative suddenly deteriorated, the clinical status deteriorated suddenly, uh, uh, and warranted a hospital admission. Uh, general examination. Important thing. Uh, anemia, anemia, pulse, blood pressure, why and JVP. Anemia. Why anemia? So in a para paravalvular leak, we'll expect hemolytic anemia. Ominous reason: young patient should be mechanical prosthetic valve or anti coagulation. Bleeding. That's exactly ominous statistically. Then of course paravalvular leak and the microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. Third. Infective endocarditis. You should look for all the features of infective, peripheral features of infective endocarditis. Temperature is normal. Yes, sir. Temperature is normal. Respiratory no, rate. Did you count? Yes, sir. Twenty-four per minute. Twenty-four. JVP. JVP. 
JVP is not elevated. Okay. JVP is not elevated. AV when we were saying with a normal respiratory okay, form. Fine. The cardiac body. The cardiac size like. Um, cardiac. There is a cardiomegaly and the apex is felt. in the left fifth intercostal space in the mid clavicular okay. line and it is forceful in forceful in character so cardiomegaly is very minimal if at all there yeah. fifth in the mid clavicular fifth in the mid clavicular but you can add that in a post operative case uh, there can be some limitations in evaluating the cardiac size based no. on the location of the apex because of the pleural fibrosis all those things there can be but it is a forceful apex yes sir forceful apex yeah so as uh, usually we say whether it is an lv type of apex is it a volume load pressure load that you have to analyze okay go there ahead there is a left parasternal heave parasternal grade 2 parasternal heave so there is an rv yes. lift okay uh, no epigastric pulsations and no uh, epigastric pulsations left parasternal heave okay and uh, p2 is not palpable okay no no thrills and okay. other palpable events s1 is uh, loud and metallic s2 is metallic uh there is lv s3 heard at the apex in the lv s3 oh, no. did, did i hear you you say it is lv s3 yes Lot of sounds are there, no? Two metallic valves, opening click, closing click. No, no. Do you do you generally expect a LV third sound in a patient who has had a mechanical mitral valve replacement? It's just a thought process, you know. All uh, all prosthetic valves are stenotic or regurgitant. Stenotic. So, if it is a stenotic valves, does it satisfy the criteria required to have a third heart sound? What is the what is the hemodynamic criteria required to produce a third heart sound? Uh, increase LV endostolic pressure. Increase LV endostolic. Third heart sound. What is what is the reason? What causes what the third heart sound? What has to be there? Uh, uh, rapid LV filling. Yes. Yes. Right. So rapid LV filling. Can you get it in patient who has got a prosthetic mitral valve? Now the question is. Of course, it can be filling yeah. from the other valve. That is that is equally important to remember. It can be filling from the other leaky valve, because you said the pulse pressure is very wide. So my guess is that probably. you may be right that uh, he may be having an aortic regurgitation and that might be causing wide pulse pressure and that is may also be causing the loud third heart sound what is the implication of a third heart sound in ar yeah that is if at all it is due to ar yeah yeah that's okay it implicates you can because we are very clear that you don't know the answer so you say that it indicate mm -hmm. LV dysfunction. Three in AR indicates LV dysfunction. Now my point is, S3 in MR, S3 in MR indicates. This is it. Indicates okay. one is the one is the third heart sound. That's the question. No. Increase flow across my. Yeah, that's right. So, so the indication of severity of regurgitation. So implication of of S3. First of all, condition to be satisfied. Second thing is implications are different. If it is a mitral regurgitation, third sound is different from aortic regurgitation, third heart sound. So, and when you got two walls, you know, it is difficult. So many sounds should be heard: P2 loud, third heart sound, and uh, sharp opening uh, click and closing clicks. So these are all important. Anyway, be that as it may, go ahead. Now, I, I, my point. That, I want to stress the point that interpretation of this sound in double valve replacement or in any valve replacement, it is not easy. Okay, it requires clinical skill to identify this because 
to say that the LDF3 or an opening uh, click it is extremely difficult. Why do you prefer it is LVS3? Because you can have an opening click of the microwave processes also. Why do you say it is third sound? So that is important. Where you found it, you landed up in trouble. You could have said that there is an early diastolic sound. I feel it is third sound. Because you can have prosthetic well sounds. As uh, Dr. Koshi said, you can have the opening click and the closing sound of the two well. So there are possibilities of post sound. To one in extra diastole and one in extra systole. So first, don't jump to a conclusion that this is a third sound unless you are very sure. When you have to answer that question, is it third sound or it's an opening sound of microvalve processes? How do you differentiate that? Which occurs earlier? Timing it Which occurs earlier? Yeah. Close. No. The opening occurs earlier. Am I right? Then only third sound. Yeah. The valve has to open, then only the flow can come. Okay. But a more important, simple thing, timing is difficult, the pitch of the sound. You have to look at the pitch of the sound. Is it a soft sound or a sharp sound? Okay. The next thing is third sound in this situation. What are the things? If it is right. One, as sir said, there will be some degree of stenosis, but still it doesn't prevent a third sound of left ventricular dysfunction origin. Either because of significant LV dysfunction or secondary to aortic regurgitation in presence of LV dysfunction, or there is a mitral regurgitation which is contributing to that third sound. You can have mitral regurgitation following prosthetic valve, especially because the patient had a stormy event after surgery. So if it is a third sound, you have to look whether it is due to LV dysfunction or whether it is due to significant mitral regurgitation plus LV dysfunction. Uh, no, you told the JVP is not, it's not elevated. Elevated. the waveforms are normal. What will happen to the waveform if there is a right ventricular dysfunction to a tricuspid regurgitation? Uh, AV waves, prominent AV waves. So seldom you hear right ventricular third sound, even in presence of significant uh, heart fear there. So if there is a right ventricular third sound, there should be evidence of right heart fear. Cause for a um, RV third sound, like pulmonary hypertension is a commoner. So here you have found that the second sound is not, uh, you, it is difficult because there is a metabolic valve. So it is extremely not difficult easy. to assess the P2. Okay, because said the first and second sound are loud and metallic. Yes. There is an early diastolic sound or then is left in part third sound. Yes. Okay, then go ahead. Then uh, grade two by summer in the IOTIC area. Uh, but I heard uh, in expression patient learning and leaning forward. No, that is not needed. For I IOTIC don't area. think those things are very important in a patient with a pause. Second thing, you expect uh, that sitting and leaning uh, forward is only for a AR for aortic ejection murmurs. Okay. I, I think the candidate. Do you consider it as an image? No, sir. Uh, yeah, normal prosthetic wells will have this radiant and systolic murmur. Okay. Systolic. Any other murmur? No other murmurs, no other sounds. So there's no rigor to the No, no AR murmur. No, sir. No mitral regurgitation. There is remember. only an outflow murmur. Yes. Aortic ejection murmur. So is the patient having any evidence of heart failure or any other? Yes. Could you identify any significant in this patient? See, this is a patient who had double valve replacement. After your clinical examination, have you identified any definite pointing to heart failure? Either left ventricular dysfunction, right 
any valvular abnormality, well dysfunction, or any arrhythmia, which can explain the clinical situation. Only cardiomegaly and heart failure uh, we can identify. So you think is there any heart failure? Uh, yes, any right heart failure? No right heart failure, uh, but uh, Feel any chest is clear? No, sir. Chest bilateral crepitations were there. I think what is the limitation? This patient was highly intermitted to the hospital. Treated. Yeah, recently treated. Improved and discharged. Yeah. He's on. He's on treatment. So the final. I just treatment. want to ask the candidate what is. Is the duration of a bibasal crepitations in a patient like this? What does that indicate if there's a bibasal crepitations? How much? More than 25 millimeters. So, so there must be a reason for LA pressure to go that high. And then this patient, if at all you're telling that. I may not be very particular about that crap. Which is respiratory rate is only 22. I if the pulmonary 24. Venous, uh, 24. If the pulmonary venous defined in these types of situations, the patient will be really very really opening. So very that I will keep, keep this straight. Exactly. The lung signs are seen only in acute cases. When you treat the earliest thing to appear is the lung signs okay. clear. So I may not give too much signal. But Dr. Koshi's question has to be. Does he have heart failure? Yes, because he had symptoms. He has a left ventricular. Well, a left ventricular failure is there. What is it due to? Is it due to prosthetic valve malfunction? The first question is: What is the prosthetic valve function like? There is a first thing: no prosthetic valve dysfunction. Then why the left ventricular failure? Then it is fairly simple. You have arrhythmias because the pulse is normal, JVP is normal. So, does it have significant? Then you have not picked up any murmur. Is it because of your clinical uh, failure? To, obviously, there is nothing. So, you are not picking up a lesion. But what is the murmur which can face by auscultation? Especially with the discussion which we had earlier. You are likely to miss among the valar lesions. Common it is very valar. likely in this patient. Nice to <laughs> which murmur of which murmur you are missing quite often? Murmur. Is it an early diastolic murmur? Is the murmur of M or M say out of the four, which is likely to be pardon? Mid diastolic murmur. No. It's AR murmur. What is the pulse pressure? 50. Right. No, I think it is important to realize that sometimes the parabolic murmurs to be picked up, you need to examine it more thoroughly in the axilla and region. These kind of unusual areas where the murmur is directed. It is not uncommon to miss at the bedside serious serious aortic regurgitation. We, we suspect it is there because of the clinical but I think when you do an echocardiogram, especially a transesophageal echocardiogram, prosthetic wall, you'll be surprised how often we do not hear murmurs. Take of MR can be missed very easily, just as paraval or leak of the IOP can be missed. So unable to hear a murmur at the bedside is not equivalent to existence. I think it is important to realize, to keep it in mind still, that so I think Second finally, is, I just wanted to know. I just finally, wanted to know what, we have, what type of mechanical wall was implanted in this patient. Saint Jude. Okay. Saint so what we have considered that is Saint Jude. But in Saint Jude's uh, medical uh, mechanical uh, wall, do you ever hear a opening sound? Prostate. Opening sounds in a St. Jude's mechanical wall. No, question is, do you hear yeah. the opening sound? Do you do opening sounds? 
I think everybody has to go back to the classic article published in the Ascultation of the Prosthetic Walls. <clears throat> Actually, only the started board wall, ball in cage, used to put sounds both in opening and closing. Most of these uh, disc walls, they behave like walls. They behave like God-given walls. They only make noise when they close. They don't make open. So disc walls are more like a native walls. So just a fundamental principle. So Pagan is the cause of his, of his deterioration, the post operative in this patient. I think it is very clear. Is it prosthetic valve malfunction? One thing. Because if there is a prosthetic valve malfunction, as Sir said, the murmurs, if narrowing, which is not very com common in a short time, it may not produce an audible. Second parallel leak may not. So that is one thing you have to look into. Or is it an LV disorder third sound? As Sir said, if it is a disc valve, even if it produces an opening, Sound easily audible, which can right. be picked up by a, a person who has not been very trained in auscultation. Well, Rausar may pick up, but if you have heard it in this case, then it is less likely to be the micro opening sound of face. So, in that case, I will say that if you have heard a third sound or a sound over the effect rate, it is third. That is a finding. If there is a third sound over the effect rate, that means there is LV dysfunction. Is it because of a valvular dysfunction mainly due to aortic regurgitation plus or is it due to a LV myocardial dysfunction? That is the way you have to look into this case. Rather than grilling the student again and again, we may add also for the benefit of the other. Those are the two important things to be found out. We have to evaluate and find out whether the person and if it is not there, then it is very likely to be related to myocardial disease. See, so, the left ventricular function was bad even prior to surgery. We don't know. But so I just want to ask the candidate, how does he go about in evaluating such a patient? Okay. That patient is yours and you are taking care of it. So how do you decide whether the valve is or the myocardium is the problem by all the investigations you have? Okay. Um, Sir is asking investigations quickly. In order of importance. In order of importance. X-ray. X-ray, ECG, and echo. Which is uh, more important for you to sort out this issue? That is a question. Oh, echo is a motion. Echo. Because the ECG Even may not help us because sinus is not show much because there is no clinical evidence of pH. In either case, it will be normal or we don't atrial abnormality may be there, so it may not help us. X ray, you may see both the valmer venous congestion of certain degree, but that doesn't help us to sort out the issue whether it is prosthetic valve or myocardial dysfunction. So we will go straight to the echocardiogram, sir. It even uh -huh. may require a of yeah. to look at the paravalvular leak, yeah, in a very precise. But straight okay, to first that, to go for transthoracic. Yeah. If you get adequate information, fine. What are the parameters of LV dysfunction? Which one would you like to look at it? Okay, you see this showing something. Quickly, quickly you tell what is it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's right. What is the importance? Uh, aortic well, uh, there's a conduction of a. Mm. But in this case, more like, likely to be myocardial problem. That also you have to strongly consider. Okay. Well, there is no, no other conduction normalities. When there is an LBB in these types of cases, the background, which are more likely to be myocardial contribution, could be aortic well also, which it has been surgery. But then, very, very unlikely to be isolated LBB. Okay, fine. Next. Quickly because, okay, fine. This is a single disc wall. It is not a St. Jude's. Yeah. 
Yeah. That can produce soap and sound. Yeah, yeah. That can produce that can produce opening sound faintly. In cage ball, the opening sound will be sharper and sh uh, louder. Whereas in the opening sound, if it is heard, it will be much much faint compared to the closing sound. Okay. And this one. Yeah. This is TTK. Does it help you much? Uh, no, cardiomegaly. No, no. I, I will ask the question in a certain detail. Does fluoroscopy help yeah. the patient? Help you? you have to have the fluoroscopy. Uh, yes, sir. If you are expecting an obstructed. Uh, will it help fluoroscopy for a TTK? Oh, that's, the part. that's the point. That this disc is mechanic. Is, uh, that's the point. That the single disc in the TT is it made up of what? Not sure. You said sure. not sure. Not sure. <laughs> you cannot see it. You know, fluoroscopically. That is called a chitra valve, actually. TTK only the what do you call it? The DTK is the same chitra valve, no? Same chitra. Same. That is a, no, no, TTK is the same. I only think TTK is no, marketing no. it. Yeah, TTK. But for a person who is in Kerala, not knowing much about Chitra Hall will be will not give a good impression to the examiners. Okay. <laughs> it's useful in another way. You can see the stability of the valve. There is there is yeah, sure. Sure. Look at the, the stability defect. of the valve, whether there is a rocking moment that is moving up and down. That especially when there is a parallel leak. Especially following yeah. a prosthetic valve endocarditis. So it is, you see, the stability of the valve. Suppose it is unstable, that means there is a MAR or a R. In fact, that, that is more important because we don't expect much for the disc. Yeah. And stability, unstability is more often than the aortic unstability. Well, it's a larger valve and the problems that is useful. Now go to the echo card again. Let's go to the echo, yeah. Okay. So you go on speaking? Yes, sir. Epical you are running comment. The epical four chamber view. Uh, left ventricle is dilated. The hypokinesia of the interventricular septum and uh, global hypokinesia, oral global hypokinesia will be dysfunction. Uh, mitral valve opening is seen. It... It's not mitral valve. I think it is something else. It is a as the single dish, you cannot call it as any okay. idea why a mitral wall is called a mitral. <laughs> <laughs> to the history of cardiology, you will be in trouble with the uh, rouser. No, 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 <laughs> but at least wall is called a mitral wall, we should know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, sir. <laughs> Okay, I think you know it. It resembles the. Oh, it is a, it's called mitral. There is severe LP dysfunction. What about the lateral wall movement and all that? Uh, sir, uh, inter interventricular septal is more hypokinetic than lateral. Yeah. Also, okay. you can say that the LV seems to be dilated. There is. Yes. And there is a valve motion abnormality involving mainly the interventricular septum and the anterior valve. It seems to be contracting better. The mitral valve disc, uh, it is for excursion. Is there. But um, assessment of the physiology you require a little more thing. So what else you want now? In the shape of the LV, is it normal or abnormal? Shape? Okay. Sigmoid. No, no, no. They are not worried about sigmoid. Is it spherical or? Normally, it's bullet spherical. It's a dilated remodel delby, no? Yeah. Uh, you find that more towards the FX and mid cavity, it is bulging. Normally, yeah. it should go towards the FX. So, here the basal yeah. part, it is okay. It is not normal, but the mid and the epical part is bulging. So mm. definitely there is myocardial disc. Oh. It is thin also. Yeah. And when you look at the mitral annulus, the there is some peculiarity there.
Let us have the color so that we will get some idea. Uh, something there. There is a rent actually. Uh, hmm. There is a there is a rent like uh, something there. We would like to know whether there was a there was an MR para valvular leak. But it is not shaking. It is not rocking. Okay, go ahead. Color. Uh, next. Yeah. Okay. What do you think? No significant gradient. Uh, turbulence doesn't have. Is there a significant MR in this view? No. Uh, but is there the view to, to evaluate it? No, you have to. Yep. And there is a mechanical wall. Epical two, a... Epical two chamber and the parastanol also has. Yeah. Uh, no, no. Turbulence. That is all what you can say. But you have to say that I have to put yeah. the Doppler and see the velocity. Say multiple views to look for micro regurgitation. Yeah. But the inflow can yes. be easily assessed in putting the Doppler. Okay. Yes. Regurgitation, you have to take multiple views. Okay. Okay. And Doppler, right? And uh, mean gradient is only 3 millimeters of micro. Okay, fine. Microwave processes is functioning reasonably well. Yes. Now you have to look into the IOTIC valve. Okay. IOTIC microwave valve process. Okay. Okay. Yes, yeah, so suggested. Instant yeah. um, injected process. So you can see there is AR. There is what? That blood pressure of 50, pulse pressure of 50 is said. Yeah. And the post it, oh, it. there you have to take. What do you find? Between diuretic valve. Sorry. Yes, Koshi. What do you find? First, you describe the view. What view is this? Yes, a peristernal short axis view. Uh, the level of iota, not iota, iota or iotic, iotic group. valve. Iotic, iotic, iotic group. No, the iotic channelers, iotic, iotic valve. What you are yeah. seeing there? Yeah, is it? Do it there? At least yeah. with this image? Mm -hmm. Okay. Something is seen then anteriorly, you know? Yes. How to know? Okay, we have to confirm. Uh, color Doppler yeah, and the T. Color, color, color. You put. Now you find that jet is eccentric. Okay. And the jet is striking the interventricular septum. I think it's triple jets. Now we are not bothered about that gradient as such. Now we are bothered about that iodic valve. One jet is coming from sides. I don't know whether there is another jet also coming. Sir, and have further views? Yeah, yeah. I think we need to have... Uh, but <clears throat> seems that, am I right, Dr. Koshi? I also think so, sir. Yeah. So, the important liking the interval class septum is this murmur will be better heard along this sternal border. Whereas if the jet is going posteriorly, the murmur may be heard over the apex beat. And if AR murmur is described in the apex and the axilla, when it is a posteriorly done, that is well described. Okay. Okay. Radiant is 29. Mean is only 15. Next. Transit a page like first time. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is across of mitral valve. Is there a paravalvular leak? Minor. Mm -hmm. Iotic, you can see that. Yes. Recording in progress. Can you see, Hari, the uh, single leaflet moving? That is. Uh, 
if you put color in this view you could have seen about the parallelar this view okay. i would think uh, are you can you see a, can you see Yeah, between the aortic yeah. and the aorta there is yeah. Yeah. that we saw in the, the yeah, we saw yeah, that in the transthoracic only thing we had to see the color through that physical four chamber view there was a color jet coming uh, from there the was a color only thing yeah, it, it yeah, but, say that it is coming uh, from that point yeah, that that's right that's right i remember that time the regurgitation was more now in fact the regurgitation has come down and whether the edp has gone up lv diastolic pressure has gone up well with the yeah what is the valve in the aortic position cool leaflet said the aortic leaflet looks like a saint jude valve yeah yeah there's a the two yes the aortic valve is saint jude yeah and the other one is a ttk because there are two leaflets are same oh no only one leaflet is moving the other is not the leaflet that is and the may not the struts look like a ttk the struts look like ttk that is the paravalvular leak area okay yeah because the other one is not bright it is not uh, maybe maybe it's a single sir. leaflet and the struts are ttk yeah struts okay. are only single disc one yeah okay not, uh, The radio and the also now the just external yeah. suggestion of a TTK, yeah. not that yeah. of a same. There's a cross, maybe artifact. Okay, the maybe color. I'm not sure. But only thing this view. Yeah, yeah this para extra space. Here you are. We not are not able. That extra space trans- you are not finding any color. The transthoracic goes better to pick up the. Other la, namle ya. We are not finding any color through that. we should tilt it a little side then only you may be because now you are seeing the flow in the aortic side this systolic end so if you had to put it a little towards the lv side probably now you are not seeing that gap maybe because we found a rather long space you know many sutures should i given way if you have to find this space then you should have found a good paravalvular jet which we are not finding okay view no okay what is the lv diameter do you have the lv diameter we have not found a modeco yes i'm just Just to get an idea about what is definitely you take a dilate, not out of dilate, not out. Dilate, so certainly. So the final conclusion, Harry. Now you cannot make the mistake. <laughs> what are the factors contributing to this? Sir, uh, it is mainly number one. lv dysfunction due to lv dysfunction contributed by, by contributed by left ventricular branch block pardon left ventricular branch block no, no, no. And, uh, myocardial problem Cardic, myocardial yeah aortic regurgitation and dyssynchrony so i think you have to discuss this case you have lv dysfunction due to myocardial that is the main thing yes aortic regurgitation to be assessed because assessment the severity the presence of lv dysfunction has a lot of limitations then dyssynchrony related to lvd these are the three things am i right rao sir and uh, uh, sir i think uh, the contribution of ar is yeah. because i think we got more information from the transthoracic yeah that's right the transthoracic of idea transthoracic i thought there are two jets yeah. that uh, that ar looks quite uh, Significant heart failure. You know the blood pressure is one twenty by seventy with a pulse pressure of seven. AR is certainly contributing to the LV dysfunction. I think all the three are contributing. There is thing. It is it is globular and hypokinetic. Exactly. So you have to look for the especially the for the anterior wall and the interventricular septum yeah. appear a uh, little thin and certainly 
Okay. I think whereas the lateral wall shows a better compaction. So you have to go for the coronary. It was done. Oh, yeah. It was normal. No, After no. he developed oh. symptoms, it was okay. Was it showing normal? And normal, normal bit. Prosthetic value is always very difficult, even after you have to find out the exact. Uh... So the question no, here is, no, no, what no. is the cardiac dysfunction? That is the thing because prosthetic valve dysfunction, we know it is surgical technique and all. Okay, uh, LBB more likely to be myocardial because there we have not seen septum in the views and there is no PR prolongation, nothing. So for that myocardial problem, that is one thing which you have to discuss or learn or to, because you should learn whether it was a pre-existing or whether it was a problem. So Legal techniques which you have to deal. Rao, sir. Yeah, what is the preoperative drug? Is it uh, MR plus AS or uh, plus AR? Uh, uh, MR plus plus AS. I think uh, Dr. Jabber should be able to say. Jabber, Dr. Jabber, any. Uh, it was predominantly both regurgitation lesion, MR and aortic regurgitation. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Was there a left under branch block pre existing? I don't know. Sure. LV function pre-op? Sir, LV function was good. When he went for office, good. LV function was good. He deteriorated after the surgery. Probably no, no. mitral regurgitation. Most likely. No, no, but that is the problem here is that we think LV function is good when there is regurgitant lesions. But when you My all the LV function becomes more manifest. I think we need better indices. So, well, I think uh, if you evaluate by ejection fraction, probably it will be a very good 60%. But if you do other methods, as a matter of fact, there are one or two studies to show a cardiac MRI uh, before this wall replacement. Fibrosis is not there. The chance of reg regression and recovery is much better as where there is a lot of fibrosis. Huh. So, especially in both aortic regurgitation and regurgitation, it's a very difficult decision. And actually, I have some other problem. Uh, is there a role for RNA in visual LV dysfunction after wall replacement? There's a trial going on now. It's called a trip, uh, what do you call? Um, um, uh, it is uh, for uh, residual LV dysfunction uh, in regurgitant lesions. So there is now it's an ongoing triple R study, and the results will be out in uh, 2026. So they believe that uh, there's a role for nephrolysin and sarcopetal uh, inhibitors in these patients. In this patient, particularly. I think un unless you correct that uh, paraval, uh, I hope it is not going to come out of this LV dysfunction. So what can we do for so, this patient? What are the therapeutic options? He says, I don't want surgery. So what Basically, are the next we options? We have said that there are related, myocardium related, electrical. So we have to assess the things which are correctable or which will respond to treatment. Okay. Good exercise for you people at this stage. Hari, can, we do, can we do something by intervention? Yeah, exactly. Non-surgical. Non have you seen the uh, paravalvular leak being corrected in our center? So, valve in valve replacement. No, no, no. 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 Parabella lives through an intervention method without surgery. See, so, there's no problem. Yeah. Problem, problem is with the suture, you know. The suture side you are paying. Yeah, have you corrected parabella links? Is there parabella link multiple devices, including three yeah, yeah. plex PDA device, uh, <laughs> vascular plex and all can be used to fill that. Space between the valve and the annular. That space we can feel the vascular flood. Yeah, it has been actually there is actually there is a large series from Mayo Clinic. 
uh, that Charanji Trihal is presented the data with the parabolic leaks and mitral vegetation. I am not aware of the ceiling of the parabolic leaks, parabolic leaks. But he presented the data with the parabolic mitral process. In one of our meetings, I think it was presented beautifully, different views, different methods of parabolic leaks. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Here the thing is, one says the myocardium. I personally feel that the myocardium is the yeah. main contributor. The valve parabolic leak difficult to assess the magnitude of the leak, but it is possible. So many other parameters, but rather than looking at this alone, then there is LB dysfunction, which is difficult. Things become extremely difficult. Then the role of LBB that we don't know. First you have to say, sir, first I will stabilize him medically. With what all mothers, you have to test him. Second, I will assess the myocardial function by different methods. The assessor said your ejection fraction may be global strain. You have to look for cardiac myocardium like and all those things. And then the regurgitation also can be assessed in a better fashion. Because here we found it extremely difficult to assess the severity of AR. <laughs> Uh, trans esophageal, as Dr. Uh, Koshi and me also think that the trans thoracic provide AAR, but we didn't get adequate information from trans esophageal. So, got good role to see what is, especially if you are looking at the, the uh, resynchronization discipline, we have to assess. So, the myocardium, we have to assess by various methods. In, the cardiac MRI will be useful in assessing the significance of MR and better quality of everything. So these are the things which I cross my mind. We may not go into the I'm not updated on that. And Harry, I just want to ask if the double valve replacement recently MR, uh, what is the current recommendation? When can they undergo MR? The, the, MR, five Tesla MR or a three Tesla MR? No, no, no. I think... Uh, uh, only 1.5 Tesla MR is permissible, and it is said the answer have to elapse. Yeah, yes, sir. at least three months because they have uh, to otherwise. Uh, yeah, yeah in this place. Yeah. magnetic field like three Tesla MR. Yeah, that's why pregnancy, if you want to have cardiovascular system by MR, right, should not. This said that you have to wait for six months. We had a recently a problem wherein it underwent a prosthetic calls and was an anticoagulant, and then uh, the neurologist wanted to do the MRI uh, to see your uh, chances of those things. So when we reviewed it, you know, it is better to use only 1.5 Tesla and uh, better to wait at least six months for safe period. So many other investors, you cannot jump to other investors because the market has yeah, yeah. fairly well before planning surgery, which includes the echo, assess the viability of the myocardium. Then other imaging modalities also tell and status. And only you should go, but personally, I feel this may be a good case for uh, surgery. Now, whether the uh, the device closure that again depends on what is the extent of the leak and what is the amount of leak from each side that is important. So, a meticulous evaluation of that which will uh, get a good information from cardiac MR about the, the paravalar leak, the magnitude and anatomy of the paravalar leak. Uh, okay. There was a difference of opinion regarding the management, and uh, uh, one group thought a correction of the paravalar leak is more important. So uh, uh, some people, uh, I, I personally thought it is likely to be more contributed by the myocardial problem rather than the paravalular leak. So whether to correct the paravalular leak or not is a debatable thing. We are waiting. The patient has improved. Clinical status is good. When I saw the patient earlier, there was an audible murmur of aortic regurgitation. And now it's not there. And uh, one difference in my clinical finding is he has got significant cardiomegaly. It is in the sixth left intercostal space close to the uh, 
axillary anterior yes. axillary line so you should think java right. differs with the findings of the <laughs> students <laughs> because of this patient i think for a long yeah. but doctor seen for the medical management no yes he, she, he has significant ഇമ്പ്രൂവ്ഡ്മെന്റ്സ്മെന്റ്സ്മെന്റ്സ്മെന്റ്സ്മെന്റ്സ്മെന്റ്സ്മെന്റ്സ്മെന്റ്സ്
anybody has uh, uh, corrected all given uh, all the five if not four three like that exactly <laughs> Doctor, 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 Sanjeev, clear has done four questions correctly. Okay, fine, fine, great. Sanjeev, Cloud, uh, Cloud. Sanjeev, Claire. Claire. He's from. He's from. Graduation in procurement. In which college? Uh, sir, GMC Trishur, sir. Trishur, Trishur. Trishur. Yes. Third year now. Just started. That is Sanjeev, Claire. But yeah. I, I yes, would sir. like to come live also. Let us see you also. I am in... impossible. I am... Video? Uh, yes, sir. I am here. Yeah, yeah. Oh, we have seen you earlier somewhere at the meetings. Okay, fine. Yes, meeting okay. conference. So <laughs> yes. Thank you. We okay. have only one prize. Yabre or Neolo, right? Namin? Yes, Doctor. And Doctor uh, uh, Vidas, uh, I don't know what is the full name. Vidas, he also done four questions correct. And uh, yeah, one more. He also should be. Yes, Doctor. Doc, Doctor Vidas. Vidas. So three has uh, three. From which medical college? Doctor Vidas he is not mentioned. I also tried. Dr. Vidas, okay. I'll check whether Dr. Yes, he is there. Dr. Where? Vidas. Vidas, oh. Vidas, why don't you, Vidas, why don't you reveal your identity oh. plus video? No. Ah. Ah. So I'm from Trinal Valley. Okay, okay, very good, very good. The third person is? Yes, doctor. And the third person is Dr. Nilanjan Majumdar. Uh, he is, I think, from that is a, am I right? Yes, doctor. That's right. Doctor is here. Doctor, doc, doc, doctor, doctor, okay. Nilanjan, sir. And I am. I... <laughs> <laughs> he joined after I left, but still. Uh, eh? Yes, sir. I should get excited now when I hear. Oh, right. Obviously. <laughs> Obviously. Okay, fine. Three, three people. I mean, those three people should be given the certificate and the gift. Okay, doctor. Okay. Sure, doctor. Yeah. But to be very frank, if I was in that position, I don't know whether I would have uh, made it three. I, would have, I don't know. The sarcoid crossed my mind because that parasol long axis is the basic theme. So arrhythmias and an abnormal ventricle and a, it's not an acute problem. Somebody uh, stress cardiomyopathy, it is a chronic problem. Okay. Uh, VDA definitely it was our bread and butter. That is a standard thing. <laughs> Artifact, fortunately, I made it. So then what was the next thing? That AR I would have attempted. I would have attempted. I would have say, Koshi helped me. Because I was thinking this is a hemopericardium from where high hypertrophy. Then I found out that flap I didn't see. I think I have to uh, I had to get the help from to come to the conclusion that it is hemopericardium due to dissection and rupture. Okay. Uh, thank you all, sir. Uh, so we need thank you, Jabal. There are a lot of things. It's got a <laughs> Thank you. But, uh, Mr. Navin, <laughs> it's a learning process, sir. It's a Mr. Naveen, I also corrected four. So why can't you give me a... <laughs> Naveen, uh, next time you should, uh, you should give uh, for the examiner who has scored the most. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm not sure. laughs> uh, Sir, it's like this. There's nothing serious. Okay. So the three students, they are at par examiners. But don't get excited. Okay. Whenever there is an uphill, there is a rapid down. It's like the AR. Rapid upstroke and rapid downstroke. Ill sustained. Okay, fine. Big. So don't be taken away by the appreciation we have given to the three candidates. Doesn't mean that that's good. Now, say today it is your day. And let us try the luck for the next session. Browser is uh, yeah. quiet. Yes, yeah. left. I think, ah, I, think yes. I enjoyed it uh, as much as the everybody in the, in, yeah. in the meeting. Uh, basically, I think uh, uh, the more students you see, there are a lot of comments uh, in their presentations and uh, in the same uh, wrong answers. And this, uh, some are casual answers, some are 
seriously wrong. So, but uh, I think it's perfect. Nobody becomes perfect overnight. I think uh, all of us have learned it over a period of being. So I'm sure it is only beginning of your career. But I think you should take it more positively that you are fairly well as a student, Dr. Haridas. And I'm sure uh, you attend uh, these uh, uh, bedside clinics. Probably by the end of one year, you would have, that's my wish, and that is the aim of this meeting. Yes, and I hope uh, the new uh, yeah, patronage are, of this kind of... Yes, sir. Every month we are planning for one session. I, I, uh, I keep in touch with you and we'll uh, 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 inform you in advance. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Thank you, doctor. Thanks yeah, for the opportunity. Right to allow the reduce here now. Fine.